How are you doing this week? Good? Somewhat good? <laughs> well, some weeks are good, some weeks aren't so good. We all know what it's like to have a bad day or a bad week. And as we pick up the text today, we see that these are, in fact, some of the worst days imaginable for the Israelites. They're in bondage in Egypt, and so we're picking it up in Exodus 2. But let's back it up real fast to Exodus 1, verse 22, and just get a running start with the context here. First, let me, let me pray and just ask for the Spirit's help today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Once again, Lord, we don't take this for granted that we can study it together as a church family, be uplifted and encouraged by who you are and what you've done. And so, Father, we ask that you would use your word today and empower us through your spirit to live out what we learn and apply it. And, Father, help me in my responsibility to make it clear today. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so there's a new law in effect in Egypt. Check this out. This is Exodus 1.22. It says, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. It's like, wow, what is a, what is a parent to do at a time like that? What is a Hebrew mother, Hebrew father supposed to do when the law is to commit infanticide of all the male children into the, the river? So let's pick it up in Exodus 2 and see how Moses' family responds. We're introduced to Moses here. Verse 1 says this, Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. So here we have a, a classic romance story, boy meets girl, and they, they get married, they have a child, and it's a man from the priestly tribe of Levi and his wife from the same tribe. We're not given their names here, but later on in Scripture we learn that their names are Amram and Jochebed. They conceive, they give birth to a fine child who is the seventh from Abraham in Levi's line. Now, the, the text goes out of its way to say that the child was beautiful. Now, that seems kind of like a duh statement. Parents in the room, you know why I'm saying that? <laughs> right? Because every child is beautiful in the eyes of the parents. Has there ever been a parent that does not believe that their baby is a beautiful child? My girls are so beautiful when they're born. Now that I look back at the photos shortly after their birth and think, wow, they look you know, beautiful, like in, a, in an extraterrestrial kind of way, you know, uh, <laughs> look like little Martians. I, you never hear a parent saying, come see our new baby, they're so ugly, it's always, our child's so beautiful. But there's more going on here. This is the word tov in Hebrew, tov, which is a, an often used word in Hebrew because it's also the word for good, just good, tov. In fact, today, in modern Hebrew, boker tov is good morning. And so, that word is used here. Tov, good, beautiful, fine. That's actually the same exact word that God used in Genesis 1 when he surveyed his creation. He described over and over in the beginning that his creation was tov. It was good. So at this point, I want, want to remind you about our context. Remember, Exodus is just part two in the five-part series known as the Pentateuch. There's Genesis first, and then Exodus. And so this is all in the same bundle of, of books. Remember, Exodus is written for you, but it's not written to you. The, the audience was ancient Israelites. And they would have heard this sentence and remembered Genesis 1. The story is telling them that God is allowing something significant to happen by letting this baby be born. He's doing something good. He's doing something tov here, despite their pain. And so this child is born, he's good, and actually later in Scripture it says that Moses is lovely in the sight of God. Now let's see what happens. What are they going to do with this beautiful child that Pharaoh told them to execute, essentially? Verse 3, but when she could hide him no longer, when Moses' mother could no longer hide Moses, she got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. So apparently this little boy is healthy. He's got a good set of lungs. They're unable to hide him. I mean, imagine that. A newborn child, you know how much they cry. And so they're trying to, to not let anybody know that they have this child. But after a while, they can't hide him anymore. And so she makes a, a basket out of papyrus, and she covers it with tar and pitch. Now here, we get another throwback 
to Genesis. I thought this was fascinating. The word used to describe this basket is teva, which in Hebrew is also the word for ark, like Noah's ark in Genesis chapter 6. Notice the parallels with Noah's ark. It's covered over with tar and pitch. Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is writing this story in such a clever way that he's, he's drawing our attention that this is the same God. Here he is preserving, once again, another Savior for his people, and thus preserving the seed of the coming Messiah. The Israelites, upon hearing this, would have immediately reminded, been reminded of what God did for Noah's family. God is a provider. This is his provision, his intentional care, his protection. The same way he did it in the time of Noah, he's doing it now in the time of Moses, which is a powerful reminder for us. It brings us to our first point today, is to remember the character of God. Remember the character of God, who he is and who he has always been. Life can be painful at times because of our sin, but don't forget that God has always provided for his people, just as he did in the times of Noah, he does again in the time of Moses, and he does it again in our day. If you're discouraged today, don't forget who God is and what he's done. Don't forget who you are to God. Maybe some of you limped in here today, so to speak. Life feels crazy, you're hurting, you're worried. Maybe you're stressed out, you're anxious, things are out of your control. But God's message to you is to remember who he is. Trust the Lord over and over again. He's a provider. He's one who takes care of his children. So here we see Moses' mother putting the child among the reeds. Now that might not mean too much to us, but that isn't a pointless detail either. It shows that she's trying to protect her precious child. Think about the reeds. This is a place where there's shade. Uh, there'd be some protection from wildlife there. But a moment comes where she has no choice but to turn her back and walk away. Envision that moment, placing your child in this basket. And eventually, you've got to turn and trust God. So she literally has to let go and let God. Trust that God has this. She casts her son onto the Nile and into God's care, building him a little ark first. She would do anything for her baby, including letting him go if it meant he would survive And then something crazy happens. We're introduced to a really cool little girl. Let's look at verse 4. It's talking about Moses' sister. His sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. So this is Moses' big sister, Miriam. And we're going to see her a lot in Exodus as we continue on. Scholars estimate that she's somewhere between 6 and 10 years old at this point. Her mother is a Hebrew slave, remember? And Pharaoh is not too big on things like maternity leave. And so this little girl is playing lookout for her baby brother. Maybe this was Moses' mother's plan all along to station her there to see what's going to happen. And then verse 5, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile with her maidens walking alongside the Nile. And she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid and she brought it to her. It's like, you got to be kidding me. Talk about bad timing. Moses' family took all this care to hide him for months and then to make this basket for him, hide him among the reeds. And then of all the people who discovers the child, it's the daughter of the bloodthirsty psycho who said to cast the children in the Nile in the first place. What's going on here? Is God not in control? But not so fast. There's a surprise. Look at verse 6. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Some commentators joke that the Lord must have pinched little Moses here, and so he let out a yelp, and God brought together two things that he made. He brought together the the woman's heart and a baby's cry together, and she has pity on the child. She's literally overcome with compassion for the child. And then Miriam reenters the picture. Remember, she's looking from a distance. Now she comes up when her her baby brother's discovered and says this, verse 7. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? This little girl is sharp. Think about what she's doing. She's playing mind tricks with Pharaoh's daughter. She's kind of manipulating her thoughts. She makes a very helpful suggestion here to the princess. And later on in Exodus, we're going to learn that she doesn't let her brother forget about this instance here. But how capable, how discerning. Think about yourself when you're between 6 and 10 years old. Would you have had that wherewithal to make a suggestion like this? I know I wouldn't have. 
How is this happening? How is this uneducated slave girl who's just a child, how does she have so much poise? How does she have the wherewithal to, to have this question and, and guide Pharaoh's daughter to make this choice? Well, the answer is that this is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit provides her with wisdom, with insight, and supplies her as a servant of God with the right words to speak at the right time, and he still does that today. And then here's the Pharaoh's daughter's response. Verse 8, Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Can you imagine the daughter explaining all of this to her mother? I mean, this would be such good news. It'd be hard to, to contain. She probably ran home and explained all of this to the mother. Now, we still haven't seen the Lord's name mentioned at all in this chapter, but you don't have to hear his name all the time to see that he's at work here. It's obviously the work of God. It's his sovereign hand moving the situation, the, controlling the circumstances. That's true today. Every moment, every day, he is sovereign. We don't necessarily need to see something painted in the clouds, but we know that God is at work, and we need to start paying attention to that. All sorts of things are not just happening to happen in our lives. And so he's directing this story. He's directing our stories too. And then verse 9 Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. Wow, what a turn of events. Now Moses' mother is taking care of her own baby and getting paid for it. Would any of you ladies like that arrangement? I actually read an article that described all of the things that a mother does throughout the week. You know, chauffeur cook, <laughs> babysitter, all of these different things. And if you put that into real wages, the average mother's salary for the year would be $160,000 for her time. So do with that what you will. But here she's getting paid for nursing her own child, and she nurtures in her own home. And I love what God's doing here. He's making the Pharaoh look like a total fool. Pharaoh hates these Hebrews, and so first we saw his plan A was to overwork them, Plan B was to attempt to kill the male babies through the midwives, and we saw last week that the midwives refused to do that. And then, thirdly, he tries to have the male babies thrown into the Nile, and God says, okay, nice try. I'm not going to let that happen, and in fact, I'm going to use my daughters to make a fool out of you. So we saw Shifra and Pua used by God, Moses' mother, Moses' sister, and now his very own daughter is being used by God to thwart Pharaoh's plan. Isn't that a pretty amazing? God is sucker punching him with a member of his own family. Now notice, once more though, Moses' mother has to let go and let God with respect to her son. She raises the child but then has to eventually, once again, let go of her child into the care of his Egyptian mother, quote unquote. She loosens her grip and lets God change the world. I, I wonder if Moses' mother lived to see who he would become much later on. We're not given any indication of that. Now, verse 10. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, because I drew him out of the water. Now, Pharaoh's daughter names him Moses. In Hebrew, it's Moshe. Sounds something like I drew him out of water. In Hebrew, the word is Mashe to mean to draw out. Uh, there's some debate. It might be an Egyptian name as well because some of the pharaohs are a thut mose, a mose. And so it has some sound similarity in one of those languages to drawing out of water. And that's an ironic name. It's a brilliant name because think about what Moses is later going to do. He's going to be called by God to draw his own people out of Egypt through the water, passing through the waters of the Red Sea safely through on dry ground. And so he grows up. Verse 11, now it came about in those days when Moses had grown up, comma, it's like, what? (laughs) We skipped a lot of territory right there. He goes from a child, and then he grows up. We just fast forwarded 40 years in this amount of time. He goes from toddler to grown up after a comma. In the New Testament, Stephen, the martyr, gives a speech and he fills in the gap. Listen to this from Acts chapter 7, verse 20. He says, he, Moses, was nurtured three months in his father's home, And after he had been set outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. But when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit his brethren, the sons of Israel. 
Now that gives us some perspective on who Moses is now. Four decades he's brought up as an Egyptian with the best education. He was pampered in Egypt. He would have looked like a pharaoh. In fact, he might have been the next pharaoh. There's some debate regarding that. Josephus, a Jewish historian, who sometimes we can trust, sometimes we can't, but he said this about Moses. He said that Moses was a general in the Egyptian army. He was instrumental in defeating the Ethiopians and, in fact, married the daughter of the king of Ethiopia. And so he had an amazing life in these first 40 years, a prestigious education. He lived in the lap of luxury with all the creaturely comforts. But after 40 years, Moses never forgot his true identity as a Hebrew. And so he goes out to observe his brethren, it says. And he sees something happen. Look at, again, at verse 11. Now it came about in those days... When Moses had grown up, that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Verse 12, so he looked this way and that. And when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. He went out the next day and behold, two Hebrews were fighting with each other. And he said to the offender, why are you striking your companion? But he said, the man who's in the fight, who made you a prince or a judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and said, Surely the matter has become known. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Wow, what a story. This is a story of failure, sinful stupidity, hitting rock bottom. Now we're going to notice five ways that Moses fails here. But I want to encourage you, maybe, maybe you've blown it recently. Maybe there's been a, a relationship that has been wrecked, some bridges burned, or maybe it's just some explicit immoral behavior that you've been engaged in. I mean, this is the real world, right? We struggle with sin. Maybe you've blown it recently. There is good news and hope, and I want you to see this in Moses' story. But first, notice the five ways that Moses fails here. Number one, Moses got angry, and in his anger, sinned. How do we know that Moses was sinfully angry? He killed somebody. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, that's not okay. He killed somebody in his anger. And thinking about Moses' story, I think that maybe rage and wrath was Moses' pet sin. We see him with a short fuse later on in the story. We see him throwing tablets. He's hitting rocks. Here he kills somebody. Maybe this is what Moses struggled with. The second way that Moses fails is that he stood for the right thing, but in the wrong way. He took justice into his own hands. He didn't wait upon God. Thirdly, he cared more about what people thought than what God thought. Look again at the text. It says he looked this way and that, but he never looked up towards God. He thought the only one who was concerned about seeing him was somebody else, but he didn't think that God's eyes are constantly watching. Fourthly, Moses tried to hide his sin and keep it hidden. He buries this guy that he kills in the sand like a mafioso. He's trying to ditch the body. A good old-fashioned cover-up. But sin will always find you out. It was true here, and it's true in our lives. And then fifthly, we see that Moses appointed himself as a savior of the people. We're going to contrast this next week as we look in Exodus 3 and see it at the burning bush. Here, Moses seeks to save his people without God. He gets 40 years Ahead of God, he's filled with pride and arrogance and assumes that he's going to be a savior in his own power. God has to humble him first. And so the end of Exodus 2 is a story of humiliating failure. Here's Moses. He's a murderer. He's a runaway, an exile. Remember, who wrote the book of Exodus? Moses did. This is his autobiography right here. His own failures as a broken sinner. He's, He's bringing these up. And he's teaching us an important point, which is our next point this morning, that God uses imperfect people to accomplish his great purposes. Now, we can say a lot of ridiculous things sometimes. Here's a couple of ridiculous things. It is what it is. Have you ever said that before? It is what it is. It's like, okay, was that ever in dispute? It is not what it is. What? It is, okay, that doesn't make any sense. Or how about this? I could care less. Have you ever said that? I could care less. What should you be saying? I couldn't care less, right? If you say I could care less, doesn't that mean that you care? (laughs) 
Or how about this? All I know is, have you ever said that? All I know is, well, if that's all you know, you got issues, man. Or how about this? Mind if I ask you a question? You just did. Or that's easier said than done. Isn't everything? (laughs) Or how about this one? This is ridiculous. God can't use me because of how I failed. God cannot use me because I'm a failure. I'm imperfect. I'm a sinner. I'm broken. So God can't use me. Now that's ridiculous according to scripture. Haven't you read the Bible? All God ever does is use failures. There's no other type of person that exists other than Jesus Christ, the only perfect one. There's only one kind of Christian, the kind that has failed God. But when you do fail God, do you own your failures? Or do you deflect or blame? Or do you admit them? Do you confess them? Do you repent of them? At this moment of life, Moses is not ready to be used, but he will be, and God will use him. Just wait and see. Now, here's our final point today. If you want to be used by God, you must be prepared by God. If you want to be used by God, you must be prepared by God. So let's look back at verse 15. When Pharaoh heard of this matter, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. So here's where Midian is. It's on the eastern side of the Sinai Peninsula. The land of Midian actually kind of goes on both sides of the Gulf of Aqaba right there. But that's desert land. That makes San Diego look like a lush rainforest. It's just desolate over there in Midian. That's where Moses ends up. He goes from a somebody in Egypt to a nobody in Midian. A barren wasteland that no one wants to inhabit except for a few of Abraham's descendants through his wife Keturah. There's a nomadic people living there that are distantly related to the Hebrews. And so some have said that here is where he got his BD degree, his backside of the desert degree. God is preparing him. And then something very interesting happens in verse 16. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. When they came to Ruel, their father, he said, Why have you come back so soon today? So they said, An Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds. And what is more, he even drew the water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, Where is he then? Why is it that you have left the man behind? Invite him to have something to eat. I think this guy is eager to marry off his daughters. He's thinking, wow. And we, we already know Moses is an attractive man, right? So here's this attractive foreigner that's coming and helping us out. Go back and get him. Verse 21, Moses was willing to dwell with the man, and he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses. Then she gave birth to a son and named him Gershom, and he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. So here we have a coincidental encounter, right, with an air quotes, a foreshadowing story of Moses' role as deliverer. Here he's helping these women out. These guys are coming, kicking them away from the the well, and he steps in as the hero and drives them away and allows these daughters of this priest to water their flocks. This is the beginning of a season of preparation in Moses' life. Here he meets Ruel, a.k.a. Jethro. We're going to see he goes by two names in the Exodus account. This is his future boss and his future father-in-law. By the way, if, if your supervisor's name is Jethro, man, you know you're in the sticks, all right? So here's Moses. He's in the middle of nowhere. He starts a family, and he names his son Gershom, which means stranger there. So he's, he's exiled. He's not in familiar territory. It will become familiar. These years that he spends in the desert are going to help him as he's leading people through the desert. But here we see God is intentionally developing, growing, and refining Moses. It's going to take 40 years before the burning bush experience. Think about that. 40 years. Have you ever waited for God to do something for that long? Forty years, I'm not even 40 years old. Sometimes we can get impatient with God and the way that he does things and his preparation process. You know, 9 a.m., you have a request for God, and by 9 p.m., you're considering atheism because he hasn't responded to your request. <laughs> you know, that's how we are. Everybody wants to be Moses at the Red Sea, but nobody wants to be Moses when he's chasing sheep in the desert for 40 years. 
This is the second third of his life he spends exclusively in the desert chasing sheep around. We love glory, but we hate preparation. Do you want to be used by God? Well, what about being prepared, being taught, being humbled? Could it be that God is preparing you for something that you couldn't handle right now? Some things to ponder. Moses apparently was too strong when he was 40 years old, trying to take things into his own hands, and it ended in disaster. He's going to be used by God after another 40 years. At 80 years of age, an old man with a stick in his hand. That's who God is going to use to change the world. Now let's close off the chapter, verse 23. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died. That's good news for Moses because the charges were dropped when that king died. And the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. The point is this. Moses is not the hero of the story. Who's the hero of the story? God. Man, I'm going to try to drill that in to our heads because we love to make heroes out of people, but the only hero in Scripture is God, whether it be the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, or God the Father. God is the only true hero in Scripture. He's the one who he sees, he hears, he knows, and he cares about his people. And all that's true of us, too. He sees us, he hears us, he knows us, he cares about us. He's faithful to hear and to heal his people. He will rescue his people. We're going to read all about that. And you know what? For those of us who have put our faith in Christ, he has rescued us already. He sent his one and only son, Jesus, to be broken on a cross for you and me so that we could be forgiven. Forgiven, redeemed, prepared, and used by God. Don't let your sin drive you away from Jesus today because it was your sin that drove him to you. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Cry out to God. He'll save you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the story of Moses. We're reading the origins of an amazing man of God here. We see your hand of provision in sparing his life as a baby. We see that you were there when he made a mistake and went out to the desert in exile, running away from his murderous past. And Father, we see that you will prepare him during that time to be your servant. And so, Father, we want to trust you as you prepare us as well. What is it that you're preparing us for? We don't always know. But Lord, give us humility, give us patience in the meantime. And Father, we thank you that you are a God who sees and hears. You heard the the cries of your people, the Israelites, while they were in bondage in Egypt. Lord, you hear the cries of every single sinner who cries from the bondage of their sin, that they want to be saved. And not only do you hear, but you provided the solution to the problem. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to this earth, your perfect son, to become the perfect sacrifice for our sins. The wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve, left to our own devices. But Jesus went to that cross and paid once and for all our sin penalty, our sin debt. And he promised that whoever trusts in him and his sacrifice and in his resurrection that he is risen, that we would be saved, our sins forgiven. So if there's anybody in here today who needs to call upon you as the Savior, who wants to be rescued from bondage, would they do that now, trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, crying out to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.